I am heavily involved in making cases for antique musical instruments to allow them to be transported safely between museums and various other situations. And in the course of making cases of this sort, I've learned a few lessons and developed a few techniques, and I've decided to share them here on YouTube in case they're useful to anybody else. An instrument such as the one pictured has an unusual configuration, and a person is very unlikely to find an off-the-shelf case that's going to fit this properly and still protect it adequately. Many of these old instruments are fairly fragile and won't take the kind of abuse that a modern instrument will tolerate. So my approach provides for a lightweight yet very robust case that can be customized to any instrument shape or configuration. I've studied a number of other cases before I develop my own technique. One of the uh, cases that I've looked at is pictured here. It does not go with the instrument shown previously, but it was for another old instrument of a similar vintage. Uh, this case is made out of plywood and sort of nailed or screwed together at the corners with small strips of wood to hold the nails. Now it is made out of, I think, quarter-inch plywood, which is reasonably light, uh, although there's a lot of bowing of the case because there's no reinforcement on the long edges or the long unsupported pieces of wood, and then a lot of stress in the area of the hinges and latches is just going to bow the wood, and the case never really fits together very firmly. As can be seen in this other view of the old case, uh, the structure is really primarily in the plywood, but it is helped and supported along the edges by the thin strips of wood. But still, this is a, a very flexible structure, and it's not really any stronger than it would be if you just had pieces of wood flopping around in the breeze. Uh, the, the structure that's there from those thin ribs doesn't really make the case any stiffer. The floppiness of the wood on this case uh, means that the latches and hinges don't always work right, so the hinges may bind, the latches don't always line up correctly, they're easily sprung from various flexures of the wood, and uh, the case itself, while strong enough to protect the instrument against bumps and bangs being carried around, has very little other structural integrity, and if somebody were to, for example, sit on it or stand on it for some reason, you'd probably go right through it. The wood, the uh, quarter-inch wood isn't really strong enough to support the weight of a person, for example. And uh, while I don't consider that as a, a, an important requirement, a case should be able to ex uh, withstand accidental abuse much, strong, much more severe than uh, normal carrying around. A case such as this is at least inexpensive and readily fabricated by anybody with even a few hand and power tools available to them, but it does have some other fairly severe shortcomings in my opinion, one of which is illustrated here. The plywood always ends up being exposed along the edges and corners, and these are the areas that take the most abuse. And plywood tends to delaminate fairly easily and splinter on its individual layers, leaving a very ragged set of corners and uh, edges that quickly deteriorate, catch on things, cause minor injuries to people, snag clothing, and cause other issues. Here's a sample case that I'm going to use the construction photos of to illustrate in this video how to make such a case. Uh, in no particular order, some of the characteristics of this case which make it superior to many other uh, simple wooden cases are that the all the edges are splinter resistant and don't have exposed end fibers like you would always get with plywood. It's quite strong and would withstand the weight of a person standing on it, although that's not recommended. Uh, it is quite rigid. The sides don't bow. It feels like a much heavier case, but the weight isn't very great. It has high quality latches and other hardware. It has an aluminum valence along the long edges, 
to uh, make sure that the top and bottom parts of the case, in other words, the bottom part and the and the lid, line up properly and always stay together, even when the case is being carried with a horn in it. Uh, it has handles on the end to help pull it out of uh, shelving and a handle on the top to carry it with and that handle is also positioned to balance the case comfortably with the horn in it. If you position a handle in the center the case often hangs odd when you're trying to carry it due to very asymmetrical uh, weight distribution. It has a semi-monocoque uh, structural design with lightweight pine stringers and masonite panels. It's uh, padded by selective foam blocking. It has an integral mouthpiece and oil box that will not open in transit, thereby preventing heavy mouthpieces and other items from falling out, even under rough handling and possibly damaging the instrument. It has strong corner reinforcements to take the likely abuse that the cases would suffer on the road. And finally, uh, I think it's worth noting that all the cases I build are given distinctive colors. And uh, the reason for that is often in the chaos of uh, transporting instruments, things get laid down in funny places. And when you're trying to pick everything up at the end, uh, sometimes things get left behind or are unnoticed. And if a case is just made out of a, a normal wood color or black, well, everything else looks like that too. There's lots of wood tones around anywhere you go. Uh, pretty much any building has lots of black cases since that's a popular case color. And uh, a distinctive color does make it stand out. And uh, it's a lot harder to leave things like this behind when they're painted with bold and distinctive colors. The stringers for the case are made out of a dense pine, uh, much higher quality than you would normally see on a 2x4, for example. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what part of the tree these come from, but everywhere I've shopped, and I usually get, you know, Menards, Home Depot, Lowe's, places like that using their lumber yards. They all seem to have a product that's called Select Pine, and it usually comes in uh, like a one by one and then, you know, several feet long, or a two by two and several feet long. And the prices aren't too bad. They're usually maybe, you know, seven or eight dollars for maybe a six foot length of it. And uh, they're usually very dense, uh, very straight, totally free of um, knots and things like that. And they make a good structural uh, element for the case. Uh, but you do have to be careful to select ones that don't have any warp to them because about half of them seem to have that. I always pick through the bunch and pick the best ones. On a smaller case, I usually use stringers. They're about one by one. Uh, on larger cases, I go up to maybe an inch and a quarter uh, by an inch and a quarter. Um, I usually end up buying two by two pieces of pine from the lumber yard and then ripping them on the table saw down to whatever dimension I decide to use for the stringers. I always take a fair amount of time to study the instrument because everyone's unique and I try to make a case that matches the characteristics of the instrument. So I'll consider its shape and its weaknesses, or in other words, its weak points, where it might need extra reinforcement, how it might best slide into the case, uh, where is it uh, fragile, for example, around the bell, I want to make sure I leave a, uh, plenty of room around the instrument in those areas uh, between those and the case wall because uh, if the instrument touches the case wall and the case is subjected to shock that's passed directly into the instrument possibly damaging it. You always want to have some air space or at least padding between any part of the instrument and the case and I also have to take into account the the thickness of the pine stringers because those reduce the size of the case in, in some areas and uh, I have to keep in mind that when I'm trying to 
pick out the dimensions for the final case that I allow for those stringers in the calculation so I don't undersize the case and then put the stringers in and find out I've not left enough room for the instrument after all. So I won't bore you with all the calculations and deliberations. You can get a better idea as you go through this video and uh, get a good idea how to dimension a case of your own if you're going to follow this procedure. Uh, this photo shows uh, four long stringers uh, for the obviously for the long dimension of the case and then um, four short stringers and four more even shorter stringers. All of them have the same cross section in this case one and a quarter by one and a quarter and uh, you'll it becomes apparent why four of the short stringers are shorter than the next longest ones. The frame of the monocoque structure is made by assembling the pine stringers into sort of a wire frame shape of the finished box. And uh, the way they're joined together is without hardware. I use mortise and tenon type joints as illustrated here. Visualizing the case as laying flat, I use everything except the vertical elements of the frame. Um, the ver everything except the vertical elements have uh, tenons on them and then the vertical elements have mortises cut into them with a router. So these uh, pictures here show the long members and the uh, short horizontal members with tenons cut onto them. Uh, you could do this in many different ways. I usually use a band saw for it, but you could use pretty much any saw to cut these. And I usually make them one-third the width of the, of the stringer itself. I make the mortises using a, a standard straight router bit on a router table and then the fence of the router table is set up in such a way that the bit cuts the mortise into the uh, ends of the uh, vertical stringers and the uh, position of the router bit relative to the fence makes sure that that mortise is centered along the uh, side of the uh, stringer and then I also put marks on the uh, table of the router uh, to show me where to stop moving the wood so I don't make the mortises any longer than they need to be. The idea is they should be exactly, uh, for example, if the stringer is one and a quarter inches square, then the um, mortise should be an inch and a quarter long, not counting the uh, curved part at the end. Here is a test fit of one stringer joining into the other with the mortise and tenon. You can see here how that works and how two uh, tenons, or I'm sorry, how two uh, stringers can join into one vertical stringer at, at 90 degree angles from each other. Now uh, this photo illustrates an improperly set up mortise and tenon. You want the joint to be pretty tight, so you either have to wiggle the pieces into engagement with each other, or maybe even have to tap them into position. There shouldn't be uh, a lot of wiggle in there. And also, you should get wood-to-wood -wood joints at every contact point, except maybe the curved end where the router bit goes a bit you know, beyond the uh, technical end of the mortise. Um, this photo here shows how I had the router bit set uh, a little too deep and um, therefore the tenon doesn't go all the way to the bottom of the mortise. It should for, for optimum strength but you know it's not the end of the world but as long as I've got all the other contact points fitting well. Once all the stringers are made then I uh, start to do a test fit of the of the wood frame that the stringers comprise. You just build it up on a table putting all the pieces together just by pressure fit and uh, verify that everything adds up correctly and there's no surprises and with the um, <clears throat> the total frame assembled uh, you can even put the instrument inside of it temporarily and 
make sure that everything still looks like it's going to fit before you go any further with the assembly. Once the frame looks good in the test fit, I take it apart and then use Gorilla Glue uh, to reassemble it. I think Gorilla Glue is the ideal adhesive for this type of construction. It makes the strongest joint with the least mess and it uh, fills the gaps pretty well too when there are gaps. Um, Gorilla Glue is set by water so I use a small flux brush like you'd use for soldering plumbing pipe and a little uh, dish of water and paint both surfaces very slightly with water then apply the Gorilla Glue to it and then stick them together. It takes just long enough for the glue to start setting up uh, to allow me to position everything accurately and check all the angles uh, with a in my case a cheap plastic uh, 90 degree angle make sure that nothing is leaning to one side or another and then finally I put a set of uh, band clamps around the overall uh, frame and tension it up so that the joints are as tight together as they can be and re-verify the angles once more and then usually leave it overnight. Once the glue is set up firmly then I take the band clamps off and uh, inspect it. Uh, <clears throat> you can see here how the Gorilla Glue uh, foams up a bit and squeezes out of the joints. Wherever necessary I use a chisel and just uh, chip that away uh, to leave uh, clean uh, outer dimensions. Uh, on the inner corners it's not so important and I mostly leave it there unless there's a lot of it. Now that the stringer frame is done it's necessary to cut and inlay the various panels of the masonite in order to form the finished semi-monocoque structure. The goal is to route out the frame at a depth slightly greater than the thickness of your masonite and a width that's about half of the width of the stringers. I set up my router with a straight router bit and I recommend a carbide tipped version and the fence on the router determines how far into the width of the stringers the router bit will cut the bit needs to be wide enough to make the remaining cut. You don't want to do this in two passes. And then the depth of the bit is set according to the thickness of the masonite and then just a hair more. You want to have the masonite slightly, very slightly recessed below the top of the stringer. And we're going to sand away that difference later. The goal here is you don't want to sand the masonite, you want to sand the softer pine adjacent to it to bring them to a perfect level. Regarding the masonite, masonite's a brand name for tempered hardboard and most stores are going to carry a generic uh, flavor of this instead of the actual branded masonite. But what you're looking for is tempered hardboard and I recommend a thickness of one eighth of an inch. It's more common and it's also going to be uh, a lot lighter in the total case fabrication. There's no need to go to quarter inch except on maybe the, the very largest cases. Most cases of this type that I build don't end up being more than maybe a foot and a half on the short dimensions and you know maybe four feet or so uh, on the long dimension. And uh, between the masonite and, and a one-eighth thickness and the stringers, that's plenty of rigidity. Also, most stores are going to carry the tempered hardboard with one side being smooth or baked and the other side having a unbaked surface with a rough waffle type finish. The smooth side obviously is going to go to the outside of the case where the waffle finish side is going to be the side that goes into the inlay on the stringers and that's going to give a good grip for the uh, glue that holds it in place. Uh, one more thing to mention here is that when routing uh, tempered hardboard or sawing it or sanding it and we really don't want to sand it uh, more than absolutely necessary 
because it does mess up that nice baked surface. Anyway, when doing anything that creates dust from this, it's not like sawdust. It's extremely fine, and you can breathe it in, get it in your eyes, whatever. It's not particularly harmful, but uh, it just goes everywhere. And so you want to make sure you vacuum up frequently, keep the area clean, don't let it get all over. And I, I would recommend wearing uh, at least one of those paper face masks and some sort of goggles over your eyes to keep it out of your eyes. Um, I actually set up a couple of box fans uh, nearby with um, cheap furnace filters taped to them to draw the air and the dust towards those and capture the dust as much as possible on the filters. The technique that I use to fit each piece of masonite that will be inlaid into the case is to first remember that no part of the stringer structure is going to be absolutely straight. There's always going to be small variations. It's not going to be absolutely square. Uh, so what we're doing is a custom fit of each panel. And I start out with one side, the long side usually, of a piece of uh, masonite uh, cut so that it'll line up with one inlay on one long stringer and then the other three dimensions or the the two short ends and the other long end are cut to be maybe a half inch or so bigger and then I lay the first long side into the first stringer uh, to the degree possible it won't completely lay in because the ends are too long but you get that aligned nice and tight and then start making marks where the actual inlay is and then go back and cut it and I do one side at a time and slowly work it in until all four sides are cut and fitting perfectly with the inlay. Once all six masonite panels are set and by the way make sure to index these so you don't lose track of which one is which and which way they go in. I always make little pencil marks and I usually number the panels you know like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, or, you know, whatever, and uh, then put a little X in one corner of both the stringer frame and the masonite to uh, remind me which way they go in. And then uh, the trick is just to get some Gorilla Glue into the inlay, as shown in this photo. And uh, once again, the Gorilla Glue is set by water, so I use a flux brush and a, just a little tray of of water and I lightly paint water onto both the recess in the stringer frame and also onto the waffled finish along the edges of the masonite panels and then lay it on top of the glue and the uh, glue is as shown in the photo you don't want a super heavy bead but you want to have plenty there to make sure you have good coverage and keep in mind that the Gorilla Glue will foam out and expand I forgot to mention that when fitting the masonite panels uh, you're going to have to trim just a little bit off of each corner for it to fit in because the routed inlay does not have square corners. But this is okay because this area is going to be covered up by the metal corner reinforcements later on. I always put in the inlays on opposite sides two at a time and then use uh, some cheap bar clamps to thoroughly clamp them along the glue joint. This is necessary because you need to have a very good fit for the Gorilla Glue to set up properly and also you don't want the masonite bowing away out of the inlay and not laying nice and tight down into the inlay. So the clamps help with this and they keep everything together. Gorilla Glue sets pretty quickly so you don't need to clamp them for a long time. Usually you know two three hours is plenty. Once the Gorilla Glue has set and the clamps are removed, you just want to inspect it briefly. And this photo shows how the uh, glue uh, foams out of the gaps just a little bit. If you've put the right amount of glue on, you should get just about this. You want to have some coming out, but not a lot. With the first two panels inlaid and glued, the second two are put in in the same way. And once again, the clamps are used as shown. With the four long sides put in, 
the remaining step is to put in the two short ends and this is done the same way except you're not going to be able to use clamps on it unless you have an extremely well equipped shop uh, what I do is I start out with a small piece of plywood just a bit smaller than the end inlay set that on the floor put the inlay on one side with its glue set that or upend the whole case so that that new glued end is on the bottom with the weight of the case pressing the inlay into the recess and then I put the remaining uh, inlay on the top and use something like a paint can or a, a brick or whatever to weigh it down and then uh, this works just about as good as the clamps. Once all the panels are in I just go around the edge with a chisel and remove any excess Gorilla Glue that foamed out on the external side of the case. I don't worry about the inside yet and of course you can't get at it because it's a, a sealed up box at this point. Even with careful fitting of the inlaid panels there's always a few places where there are gaps and for the best appearance I like to use wood filler to take care of those before sanding and uh, this is the kind I found seems to work best for me it smells like Bondo I don't know if it's epoxy based or what but it's not like the other wood fillers that seem to be based on wood glue uh, this stuff definitely has an odor to it but I find it holds up a lot better and seems to grip the wood uh, much more thoroughly during sanding for example it's just more robust this kind of wood filler is like epoxy it has the basic filler but you have to mix in a little bit of hardener with it so I, I do about enough to do one panel at a time uh, if I make more than that it's already set up before I can get to the other side so it pays to be patient and just do a little bit at a time and uh, I use a small putty knife to work it in um, and since I'm at it I, I go over it pretty thoroughly I don't leave even hairline cracks or gaps untouched I fill everything once the wood filler is completely dried I go over the whole box with a belt sander um, this would be a handheld belt sander. Um, the goal here is to remove the excess stringer wood that extends up above the surface of the masonite inlay. As I mentioned, when you're doing the inlay, you always want the masonite to go down slightly below the surface of the uh, pine stringers because you want to get them flush, but you don't want to be sanding the masonite itself more than necessary so the idea is to bring the stringers down to the level of the masonite so this is I don't know any other way to do this much wood removal with any other kind of sander and not booger it up so you don't want to use a uh, a circular type sander you want to use a belt sander and always sand along the grain of the uh, wood on the stringers here are a couple of photos showing how well this approach works. You can see how everything is nice and flush and smooth. All gaps are filled with the uh, wood filler. So now it's time for painting the case. I always start out with a primer uh, and this is to fill any uh, little holes in the wood and it also gives me something to sand, uh, give a fine sanding to before putting on the final uh, outer color of paint. Uh, again, I'm trying to avoid sanding the masonite, so by putting on a couple layers of primer first, I can provide a smooth coating or a smooth base for the final paint by sanding the primer instead of sanding the wood any further. The paint that I use is uh, Krylon lacquer uh, instead of a enamel. Unfortunately, in my area, all of the hardware stores have decided they're not going to carry lacquers anymore. All of their spray paints are enamel. And uh, for several reasons, I prefer the lacquer for this type of case. It dries quicker. It's much more forgiving of uh, how long you take between coats. Many of the enamel paints require that you put subsequent coats on within 5 to 10 minutes of 
of previous coats or you might get wrinkling and other distortions. Uh, with the lacquer type paint there is no such restriction. I could do one coat a day or one coat a week and it would still come out just fine. As this photo shows the primer I use is the Krylon 1318. That's actually an old number and they've padded it with a prefix and a suffix now to make it a longer number but it still has 1318 at the core of the number. Um, since the local aces and true values and so on don't seem to carry it I buy mine from industrial suppliers where it's still commonly used. It's actually fairly inexpensive. I think I pay about five or six dollars a can for it so it's not too bad. Anyway, uh, this is the stuff I use and I usually put two coats of it down. Since I do the painting indoors, um, first off I do it in a closed off room at the end of the house so it doesn't circulate fumes into the rest of the house. I use a couple of cheapo box fans. Uh, I think these things usually cost about seven dollars a piece at the hardware store. And then I buy 20 by 20 inch by one inch uh, thick uh, basic pleated paper furnace filters, the cheapest things they have, um, and use masking tape to tape them over the fans. And with the fans on high, this provides a, a reasonable draw through the filters and it keeps uh, any of the spray particulate going in that direction and captures most of it on the filters so it doesn't end up all over the place. And then I vacate the room right after painting um, until the, the fumes have uh, settled out. And I, I also do use a respirator of the type shown here and a set of goggles uh, over the eyes during painting. I use fine sandpaper on an orbital sander and go over the uh, second coat of primer to give it a nice smooth even finish and uh, I find this is perfectly adequate for giving a decent looking uh, final coat when I put on the, uh, the, the colored paint over the, the primer. The next step is to cut the case in half, turning it from a solid box into a case bottom and a case lid. Where each case gets separated depends upon my original plans for how the horn's going to go into it uh, and any other any number of other factors. Um, I usually lean towards having a fairly shallow uh, lid but sometimes the break point is almost halfway down the the side of the case. It all you know depends. Um, one thing to keep in mind though is you don't want to make the the lid any shallower than the stringer and whatever valence is going to be used to keep the the long edges locked together when the case is closed. So keep in mind those dimensions and don't cut it any shorter than that or there will be a lot of difficulty. With the case half separated I fabricate some uh, wooden strips out of scrap pine that was used to make the stringers. These are usually about a quarter inch thick and then the width is determined by uh, the width of the aluminum valence that's going to be used uh, later on so that you know depends on whatever you end up buying but um, it provides a little extra strength for the edges where the the case was just sawed in half and it also gives a place for screws or other fasteners to go into besides the masonite uh, to attach things like the valence. Once that's done I cut some little wooden fillets and epoxy those into the corners to provide extra support for these new wooden strips where they join up with the uh, the stringers that form the frame of the case. A mistake I think a lot of people make when they're fabricating road cases at home is that they just go out to the hardware store and buy hinges and latches there and if you do that you find out they're almost always very cheaply made made out of soft materials. Uh, they're of types that don't work well and hold up to heavy handling. Uh, not very strong. Just very inferior hardware and you can get much better stuff without spending a lot of money.
Um, I like a company in California, Los Angeles area called Reliable Hardware, and here's the information for them. Uh, they don't have a minimum order. They'll ship out whatever you want. comes very quickly. Um, they do take credit card orders. I believe that they'll uh, allow you to call in with an order or do it online. Uh, I've always called in. Um, with the aluminum valence, it's important to note that they will cut it for you. Um, there's no extra charge if they cut it in any of several standard ways that they have, or you can pay a little extra and have them customize the cut. Um, I most often have them cut the um, the 12 foot length, which is what it comes in, into three four foot lengths, and this gets it under the magic number for UPS, so they don't have to uh, add a hefty surcharge for oversized items. But if you do order uh, a full uncut 12 foot length of the valence, um, I believe it's going to come taped to a big 2x4 and just ship that way. Um, but if you get it um, pre-cut, it'll probably fit in a cardboard box. And for most cases, you don't need more than about 4 foot of val valence anyway. So I'd like to take a moment to describe the hardware that I like to use. The uh, reliable hardware model numbers were shown just a little bit ago, and uh, now here are some pictures of them. Uh, the valence was already described, but uh, the next item would be the stop hinge. This is an excellent type of hinge. It lays very flat to the case. It's easy to use, it's strong, and it's got a built-in 90-degree stop so you don't need to have chains or cords or anything to keep the, the lid of the case from opening too far. Once you open it, this hinge automatically uh, moves a wire bracket that's built into it into position so that it locks the case into a 90 degree open lid position and then easily closes again when you want to close the case. It's, it's really an excellent type of hinge. The latches I like to use are this twist lock type with a spring-loaded uh, latch clasp that folds back flat against the case when the case is open instead of sticking out and getting caught on pants legs and things as people walk by. Um, it's uh, very easy to apply this type of uh, latch, it just screws in, but you do have to cut a, a, a cutout for it in the wood. And the other part of the latch that you need to buy separately is the so-called latch keeper, as shown here. Um, this is where the clasp part of the latch hooks into, and this part will go on the lid of the case. It's important to reinforce the corners of road cases instead of just leaving the exposed wood to get crushed during rough handling. Um, I like these uh, stamped metal corners. They go in with three screws, three rivets, whatever you like to use. And uh, there's two types here that are complementary. One is just the regular type, which goes on the uh, four corners of the top of the case. And then there is the other type, which has a little stamped foot in it, which would go on the four corners on the bottom of the case. Handles should be strong, they should be comfortable, something you can carry for a while without it hurting your hand. They should uh, be spring-loaded so they close the handle down flush into the case when you're not using it. This makes it easier to stack cases and things like this, or not just have the handles catch on things. Um, Reliable Hardware makes this model of, of recessed handle in both a steel version and an aluminum version. I showed the part numbers for both. The one pictured here is the aluminum version. I don't want to spend too much time on the fine points of mounting the case hardware, but uh, it is necessary to do the cutouts before doing the finished painting. Uh, that avoids you know, having to mask everything to avoid scratching up the paint with the power tools used for the cutouts. Uh, the very first step I do is I'll uh, put the instrument into the case and then put a piece of conduit or plumbing pipe or anything underneath it that I can 
roll back and forth with my fingers as if it was a knob and then this changes the center of gravity or not the center of gravity but changes the pivot point and you can find the center of gravity by just rolling it back and forth and finding where the case balances. This is important for locating the carrying handles. Uh, if you want a case to carry nice and easy you don't want it carrying lopsided because the horn is heavier on one side. Uh, I figure that the foam is lightweight enough it won't really upset the balance much. All the hardware besides the handles is symmetrical to the case so that will even out. Um, so really the only thing you're worried about is getting the horn and the body of the case balanced. I use a saber saw to make the cutouts for the handles and latches and um, just remembering that the uh, handles need to be at least the not the one on the end of the case but the uh, the one that's normally used for carrying should be positioned so it's in line with the center of gravity of the case as previously established in the in the step I just described. And uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that these recessed handles, the center of the handle is not where the center of the overall handle structure is. As you can see from the previous photos, when the handle's laying flat into its frame, that's great, but when you open it up, the handle's no longer centered with the frame. So you want to take that into account when you uh, position the cutout for the handle. So visualize when the handle's actually open, you want it to be in the center of the case so it carries properly. Because all these hardware cutouts are just made in the masonite, you don't want to stress the masonite. It's in the semi-monocoque structure. It needs support of stringers in conjunction with the strength of the masonite to have the adequate structural strength for the whole thing. So wherever you've got these cutouts, you need to glue in some uh, wooden strips and thereby provide support. Um, for the things like the handles especially I'll use a slightly thicker stick of scrap wood and use a, a milling bit and a Dremel tool to kind of auger out uh, a bit of the rails so the these uh, wooden strips can be recessed in a little bit. Uh, therefore it's not just the glue and when you pull on it the actual weight of the case is taken up by the wooden strips and not by the masonite itself. While the latch keepers are usually so close to the uh, edge of the case that they are screwed into the stringers, the latches themselves are out in the middle of the masonite and so they need reinforcement. Instead of using wood strips for this I just usually use some quarter inch plywood and uh, use regular wood glue or gorilla, gorilla glue to glue those into the panels. Uh, they're stressed sideways relative to the masonite. They're not pulling outwards. So I think this is perfectly strong doing it this way. The final bit of reinforcement that needs to be made is after locating where your hinges will be, and I have three hinges on this case, but you know you could use four. I would not use more I would not use less than three for a large case. A smaller case can get by with two. Um, only a really big case needs four. Anyway, wherever the hinges are going to be, you need to reinforce it with uh, sticks like I've got here. And I usually just mill out a bit of the rail and uh, put a tenon on the end of the uh, sticks and epoxy those in with the tenons going into the cutouts. Once again, so that the stress of the weight of the lid when it's tipped back is not going to try to bow the masonite. It's The stress is taken up by the wooden stick and transferred to the uh, the frame. One more thought on this. Besides providing just reinforcement, these wooden sticks or little pieces of plywood for the latches uh, should be epoxied or otherwise glued to the masonite as well as on the ends where they meet the stringers. But another function of these strips and pieces of plywood is to provide an adequate place for wood screws to go into uh, when you're mounting the hardware. Otherwise you're just screwing into the masonite and masonite will not take a screw. It will strip out right away. So uh, 
uh, basically the screw is just going to go through the hardware, through the masonite, and then actually go into the wooden strips or little plywood inserts. Now that the case is primed with primer paint and all the hardware cutouts have been made and, and other bits of milling and gluing are done for the reinforcements, it's time to do the finished coats of paint. I go over and put on two to three coats of the uh, finished coat which is uh, whatever color I choose, but again in the same type of lacquer as the primer is for uh, paint compatibility. And uh, once again I use this Krylon product and uh, a sample is shown on the label. Uh, this particular shade, as I mentioned before, I like visibility and this is an OSHA Safety Blue, which uh, back before they made it an industrial product when it was considered a commercial product they called this true blue. As was done with the primer I use respirator goggles and my fans with furnace filters to try to draw the overspray away from the case and trap it on the filters. Um, I always manage to get a little bit on the floor but uh, it just sweeps up with uh, you know mop and water later on. It, doesn't usually adhere to the floor so it's pretty easy to deal with but again I put on typically three coats of this um, and that on a case of this size is about two cans of paint. With the case painting done it's time to mount the case hardware. The first thing I do is put on the aluminum valence. I use a hacksaw to cut it to length and uh, I use no wood screws for this. I use always sheet metal screws and then uh, in the anything larger than about a number six screw I usually pre-drill a pilot hole but in the case of the valence that uses I use a number six screw for that and uh, drill through the valence and then put the screw through into the wood. For all the other hardware um, I drill a pilot hole and then um, use a larger size you know usually a number eight or a number ten metal uh, sheet metal screw to anchor the hardware. Uh, one thing to note about these reliable hardware valences however is that they come as a single piece extrusion with a scribe down the middle and what you have to do is bend those back and forth until the uh, scribe line breaks and then you've got two pieces. Uh, the part that goes on the lid or top of the case is one piece. The part that goes on the bottom of the case is the other piece and one fits into the other. It's pretty intuitive once you see it but um, when you first get them until you really inspect it you'll say what the heck's going on with this it doesn't seem to add up but the idea is to break the valence in half along the scribe line and uh, these valences can be inserted over the edge of plywood cases but that doesn't work with these masonite semi monocoque type cases so I have to mount the valences to those thin wood strips that were put on in a previous step. To mount the style of latch that I use, um, it's got a raised edge which requires something to go under it. I usually put a couple of small washers under it. Uh, and then because you don't want the latches shifting under load, you make sure to select a size of screw that will completely fill the diameter of the mounting hole so that it can't shift um, once in place. If you use smaller hardware it'll shift around and the latches will get loose. Before mounting the latch keepers I mount the hinges and uh, you may notice from this photo that there's two different styles of screw head here. The outer ones which have a Phillips style head those are just regular wood screws and they go uh, the top one on the lid goes into the uh, the pine stringer and the bottom one uh, at the very bottom of the latch goes into the reinforcing wooden strip that runs down underneath the masonite. The two inner screws right by the the pivot point of the hinge are actually um, bolts not screws they're machine screws and um, <clears throat> because these are so close to the valences, uh, what you actually want to do is drill and tap the valences for the size of screw you bought. Uh, 
and then the uh, the screws are basically being anchored in the aluminum valences instead of in the wood. This is stronger and just works out better, but in my case I was unable to buy both types of screw with identical heads so they look a little different here. The next thing I mount is the latch keeper on the lid of the case. Um, as with the latch, you want to use the maximum sized or maximum diameter uh, screws to go through so that the keeper cannot shift. Um, and there's another trick to this so that it works out properly. First use something like a, a beam clamp to clamp the case as firmly closed as you can so that the lid isn't floating any distance away from the bottom half of the case. And then uh, with the latch engaged in the keeper and the latch turned down tight, pull the keeper as far away from the latch as possible to put it under tension and mark where the screw holes go. Then release the latch and move the uh, keeper yet about another sixteenth of an inch or so. Uh, well, about a sixteenth of an inch. I wouldn't go over that further away from the latch because no matter how well you do this here you want it to be tight and um, I found that there's always a, still a tiny amount of shift and you can make up for it by going about an extra sixteenth of an inch and uh, that'll work out pretty good. Notice the uh, orientation of the keeper here that they're not symmetrical you have to get them oriented correctly for the the hook on the latch to engage it properly. The final piece of hardware are the corners. Um, I always use a uh, sanding drum or a milling bit in my Dremel tool and remove just a bit of wood at the corners of the case. And this is to take into account the curved corners of the uh, metal pieces that are going on here. They will cut across the sharp corners of the wood and they won't fit properly so you have to undercut the wood slightly. There's no need to repaint this if you don't want to. It's going to be covered up. Um, and once again use uh, big screws here, the biggest ones that will fit through the holes because these take a lot of abuse and if the screws are undersized your corners are going to get uh, loose and start rattling around. Finally I mount the handles. Um, <clears throat> if I have a handle on the end like this it's hinged to lay down towards the bottom and as previously mentioned the handle on the top side of the case is offset or its plate is offset so that when the handle is unfolded it will be in the center of the case but the overall handle assembly is not centered end to end on the case as previously mentioned it's located instead at the balance point of the case. So at this point the case itself is done except for blocking to pad the instrument. Uh, my objective with these is to keep the instrument relatively centered inside the uh, case box having a similar amount of clearance space on all sides uh, wherever possible. This particular case I built to be a little smaller by a few inches uh, in height than I would usually make it in order to fit uh, on a particular shelf that didn't have a lot of clearance. As a result, instead of uh, dropping the instrument straight down with the valves pointing straight up, which would have been my preference, um, I arranged to put it in, twisted at a slight angle as shown in, in these photos. Starting with the bell end of the instrument, um, <clears throat> I chose a three inch thickness of a particular foam that I like to use. This is two pound closed cell chemically cross-linked polyethylene foam. This foam tends to run in the area of five to eight dollars per square foot depending on thickness and some other aspects. Um, <clears throat> I buy mine in four by eight sheets because I use a lot of it but the companies that sell it to me also usually have quite a bit of scrap on hand and will either give it to you or sell it to you at a very low cost just to get rid of the scrap and it's often big enough pieces to use for things like this. I like to use a three inch thickness of foam at each end of the case uh, 
uh, because I'm trying to get a couple of inches clearance minimum between the case wall and the instrument and with this semi monocoque um, frame structure I've got an inch of depth lost right in the frame that the instrument can't occupy so two inches of clearance plus the extra inch the extra inch that fits uh, in between the uh, the stringers of the of the uh, case structure uh, gives me exactly what I need in this instant. I start carefully reducing the uh, basic block of foam to fit in between the uh, wood stringers and other obstructions in the case and still have a shape that will support the bell of the instrument. And I just work away at it and chop a little bit off here with a table saw, a little bit over here with the band saw, a little bit here with a hand saw, maybe use a router occasionally to chew out some of it. This uh, foam is, by the way, um, got characteristics of being very soft but yet firm. It's not going to scratch an object or mar it and it will not, even if it's a little bit loose while the instrument or other object is in transit, it won't rub shiny spots or anything onto the instrument. So it's almost like it's being held in, you know, kid gloves. It's chemically inert, the polyethylene that is, is chemically inert. It will not deteriorate over time, crumble or get soft or sticky, uh, as other types of foam often will do. Um, it will not absorb liquids, including valve oils or greases. Um, <clears throat> it's firm enough that it, it can be machined, as I mentioned, with regular saws and routers and things like that. Its main downside is that because of its closed cell nature and its chemically inert, uh, what's the word I want? It's chemically inert. Um, it's hard to find adhesives that'll work on it. So when shaping it for the case, it's always important to get it to fit precisely and tightly and have as many contact points with the case on different sides of the foam so that even a, a small amount of adhesion from the adhesive that we'll use uh, is enough to hold it in firmly. I always start with the bell as mentioned, but the next thing I'll do is do the tail end of the instrument and it's a very similar approach except instead of shaping the phone to nestle the rim of the bell um, it's mostly there to have a shape just to support the bottom end of the instrument so it doesn't wobble around and still give it a couple of good inches of clearance between the end of the instrument and the wall of the case. Uh, this particular block was done mostly with saws but the indentations to clear the recessed handle um, were done with a router. Also, I think, with a mill bit on a Dremel tool to do some of it. I think you can see where it's smoother. The router did it where it's rougher. It was hand done by the uh, Dremel tool. Once the opposite ends of the instrument have been blocked, then the work gets a whole lot easier uh, because it doesn't have to recess into the deep ends of the case structure so much. Um, here is the what I would call the next step. It's to block the middle of the instrument and hold it in the right position so um, it's not rotating or moving out of place otherwise. And in this case I selected a point near the valves that would hold the instrument at the requisite angle so it, even though it's sticking out above the bottom of the case, it's still not going to go so far up into the lid that it doesn't have any clearance up there. And uh, I just shape this again a little bit at a time uh, using bits of paper and modeling it and then finally cutting the real foam. And this was all done on a jigsaw. This center piece of foam had to be shaped in such a way that it does not prevent the instrument from being lifted out of the case. Uh, but there is a concern that if the case is dropped or set down upside down, for example, that the horn has nothing to prevent it from banging into the top of the case or the lid of the case. So I make a simple piece here uh, 
that comes down and actually contacts the top of the foam in the bottom half of the case. Um, you can see here where I laid a ruler across the foam and made sure that the top of the instrument at this point was the same height as the top of the foam so the foam coming down from the lid would lay across the bottom foam as well as touch or almost touch the horn so the horn has nowhere to go once the case is closed. Just as in the previous step I have to come back now and look at the bell end of the instrument in order for the bell to lift out there can't be anything in the big block of foam at that end to prevent it uh, lifting out so I have to make a little piece that goes in the lid that comes down and touches the top of the bell and preventing it from riding up vertically especially if the case is upended for some reason. For this particular horn I realized that there was no blocking whatsoever from the bell end until way down towards the valves and that's a large percentage of the length of the horn so I made a small pillow block uh, fitting in the bottom half of the case that surrounds the instrument on three sides but I didn't feel it was necessary to have something coming down from the lid in this case to prevent it riding up the uh, other two places where I have foam on the lid should do an adequate job there. So here's a view of the case basically complete all of the pieces of blocking foam have been cut and as I mentioned before you want to cut them so they fit firmly into the case you don't want to have to fill any gaps with uh, adhesive um, and uh, let's see this is really just a test fit so nothing is glued in yet it's all just held in by friction the next step is gluing it pretty much the best readily available adhesive I've found for closed cell polyethylene foam is good old liquid nails just the regular stuff none not one of the special versions um, it doesn't nothing really adheres to polyethylene but this stuff works about as well as anything and polyethylene foam is sometimes used in home insulation and uh, liquid nails is the recommended adhesive for attaching that to the wood structure so uh, as in this case that foam is mostly held in by close proximity to the wood frame of the house and the liquid nails adhesive is really just there to give it a little extra grip the final thing I do in most of my cases is provide a small enclosure within the case to hold things like mouthpieces, valve oil, slide grease, uh, other little sundries and I like to design these little boxes so that they open up without any hardware uh, and they're held closed while the instrument is in the case and in transit by the fact that the instrument is in the case uh, so it is impossible for the box to come open in transit and dump its contents into the case and especially heavy things like mouthpieces cannot damage the instrument. Um, you'll see from these photos that this is accomplished by having the lid of the case at some point be underneath the instrument and padded from the instrument with a small piece of foam and therefore if the horn is in the case the horn itself is preventing the little box from opening. So here's how the case came out. It's a reasonably attractive case. It's solid. It's practical. I know from experience that these this design of case will hold up in hard use uh, for at least a decade of the ones I've built. I've started building these uh, in heavy use by a, a group um, probably about 10 years ago so it's a pretty proven thing as well as ones I built from my own instrument collection. Hope that some aspects or all of the aspects of this case have helped you to design and build your own instrument cases.